Welcome to Municipal Affairs, the show dedicated to delving deep into the matters that shape municipalities across Canada. Now we're excited to bring you insightful stories, engaging discussions, and exclusive interviews with municipal leaders. Today's episode is packed full of stories from across Canada. We'll be talking about several municipal leaders last week appearing in Ottawa to speak publicly with lawmakers from the Senate and the House of Commons. We chat with Mid-Saskatchewan Municipal Alliance's newly appointed Executive Director Barry Morishita regarding the Alliance's mission. Then we head to the Wild Rose Province, where one municipal leader in Airdrie, Alberta, took the challenge of climbing three mountains to raise money for their local food bank. And then a motion at the Sault Ste. Marie City Council last week regarding Hope's Cradle has us speaking with the founder and CEO of Gems to Gems. But first, we are heading to the nation's capital. Two maritime mayors have testified before a Senate committee studying climate change impacts on critical infrastructure. David Kogan of Amherst, Nova Scotia, and Andrew Black of Tantamar, New Brunswick, spoke about the importance of the Chignecto Ismus Passing. The narrow piece of land connecting New Brunswick and Nova Scotia is the only road and rail connection between the two provinces. Mayor Black says the impact from climate change has had negative effect on the important piece of infrastructure, particularly the railway. I'm I'm not a a, a road engineer. I don't build roads. But the the road corridor that that is part of the Chignecto Ismus is actually in fairly good shape. Um, As was said earlier by somebody on the last panel, uh, the roads in New Brunswick are not in the best of shape, but that piece of Trans-Canada Highway is actually in pretty good shape. Um, The rail line, I think it would be interesting to hear from CN and ask them exactly what the uh, condition of that rail line is. I know that in 2015, uh, there was a storm that blew, blew through, significant surges, and there's a picture that is stark. Uh, You can find it online of the rail bed uh, with water from the ocean, the Bay of Fundy lapping at wheels of a train crossing that piece of uh, infrastructure. I'm sure at the time, uh, well, I shouldn't say I'm sure, I am uh, reasonably sure that the, that piece of infrastructure was probably um, a little bit at risk after that storm event. Um, But I, I think it would be interesting to hear from CN. Mayor Kogan said in the Senate committee that the rising tides of the Bay of Fundy are becoming a challenge each and every day for local communities and on the Chinecto Isthmus. The Fundy tides remain much the way they've always been. However, because the sea level is rising, then the, the highest high tides are higher than they used to be mm-hmm. and getting higher every day. So it is becoming more of a threat and our vulnerability is more apparent. Bogan also added that while the dikes along the Chinecto Isthmus are in relatively good shape, it will take less than a storm to impact them and potentially breach the dikes. Centuries old and are gradually eroding on their own. Sea level is rising and it's predicted um, some years ago that if the sea level rise continued at the level or at the rate it was, it would, there would be a permanent breach into around 2100. So that's not what is giving us the urgency that we see today. What we're worried about is what occurred, for example, in 1869 was the Sax Gale, and there was a high tide uh, with a full moon, and a hurricane came through, and the isthmus flooded, lives were lost, livestock was lost, it was it was a terrible disaster. And we now feel that because we are seeing the sea levels rise, so it will take less of a storm to breach the dikes, but our storms are getting more frequent and they're getting more intense. And and someone quoted to me, and I I like to repeat this, is that the storm of a lifetime has become an annual event. And when we look back over the last three or four years, we've had more hurricanes than we had in many, many years prior. So the vulnerability due to climate change is the issue. It's not that the dikes are destroyed, but they'll be overcome by one of these storms. And so the rail line being in good condition, the road being in good condition, and the power lines being in good condition will all be for naught when the flood occurs. While Mayor Kogan and Mayor Black were speaking in front of the Senate on Parliament Hill, Mayor of London, Ontario, Josh Morgan, was speaking to the Standing Committee of Finance about the housing crisis across Canada, and particularly in London. 
Morgan said while City of London Council has committed to building 47,000 new housing units over the next 10 years, they need ongoing support from senior levels of government to hit those potential targets. I also want to once again thank the federal government for choosing London as the first community in all of Canada to receive funding through the Housing Accelerator Fund. $74 million announced last month will allow our city to facilitate the creation of an additional 2,187 new homes over the next three years. That's an increase of 23% more than we otherwise would have built. It will also provide opportunities to support our unprecedented health and homelessness system response. We'll exploring a series of innovative housing solutions, including the conversion of vacant uh, office space in the downtown into rental housing. I'm here today as the mayor of a city with a unique perspective on housing affordability. We are one of the fastest growing cities in all of Ontario and one of the most rapidly expanding population bases in all of Canada. We've enjoyed many benefits as a result, but London has also experienced a variety of challenges, affordability being chief among them. In the face of soaring rental rates and housing prices, our council has committed to permitting the construction of 47,000 new homes over the next 10 years. Across Ontario, it's estimated that we need at least 1.5 million new homes and uh, over the next 10 years to adequately house the population. Meanwhile, there's never been a period where more than 850,000 homes have been built in any decade. So it's clear that we have an unprecedented challenge before us. All levels of government must commit to prioritizing the development of housing within existing urban and suburban areas in order to expedite housing development that is cost effective and delivered in the most timely way. Maximizing the use of existing and easily expandable physical infrastructure, including pipes, roads, and transit, is the fastest and most effective use of resources to provide new housing through intensification, infill, and logical extensions of existing development. Tonight, there will be new mayors, councillors, district education authority members, and alcohol education committee members in the territory of Nunavut. After a month-long campaign, voters in the territory will be heading to the polls today to elect new local leaders. But voters in five communities will have no races to decide today. The contest for mayor, Hamlet Council, District Education Authority, and in some communities, Alcohol Education Committee members went uncontested and are all acclaimed in. These communities include Clyde River, Coral Harbor, Kimmeret, Kukarkuk, Kikik Tarjuek. We will have results from all 25 municipalities on the Cross Border Interviews website. So if you want to visit those and keep track of what's going on in the territory of Nunavut, visit www.crossborderinterviews.ca. That's www.crossborderinterviews.ca for all your municipal election needs. Join us on Municipal Affairs and let your brand shine where it matters most, in the heart of local communities. Get in touch today and learn how you can make a meaningful impact on municipalities from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. Your success is our mission, and together, we can build stronger, thriving communities together. Reach out today. Now, before we get into this next story, I want to take a moment and say this story may contain details that many may find upsetting. Now, we believe on this show in transparency, and we want to inform you, the viewers, the listeners, about some of the issues that municipal leaders are facing on a daily basis. Some issues, some stories are positive and can lead to good outcomes. Some issues and stories have dark backgrounds, though. Now, we've never been one to shy away from the dark stories as municipal leaders from across Canada can't either. That is why we believe that this story needs to be told. At the October 10th Sault Ste. Marie City Council, Council voted to investigate the possibility of establishing a secure drop-off location where babies may be anonymously surrendered. At the request of two councillors, Council agreed to look into setting up a temperature-controlled Hope's Cradle bassinet box within the community. Councillor Angela Caputo at that meeting outlined the background of Hope's Cradle. I have spent months researching this and it has taken me that long to bring it forward because I wanted to consult with a variety of folks and because it is such incredibly heavy information. Um, I have poured over statistics of infant abandonment 
Um, how that commonly happens via dumpsters, snowbanks, back alleys, being left in apartments, and even worse than you can imagine. Um, stats of how many of these infants are recovered alive and how many are found dead. I also learned that some are never known <coughs> or discovered. Um, this is why I feel so strongly about the implementation of Hope's Cradle here in our city. I believe in a woman's right to choose, and I want to make that very clear. But these babies that are born, we have a responsibility to them. Uh, we have a responsibility to these folks who have carried them. Regardless of any whys or hows that pop into our brains, the only thing that should truly count is the preservation of these lives. For anyone faced with the moral dilemma um, because of this proposal, ask yourself why our society would rather have a birth mother and child forced to struggle and or be abused over simply allowing a no questions asked surrender. Um, <clears throat> Hope's Cradle is a safe alternative to an unsafe abandonment and that, that's it. That's where the conversation should end. We would be giving these folks a judgment-free way to surrender infants to the care of child service professionals, regardless of their mental health, whether or not they have identification, any, any factor. Um, provided that the baby shows no signs of physical harm, there will be zero repercussions for the person who chose this very safe option. Hope's Cradle is an initiative brought forward by Calgary-based organization Gems for Gems. Gems for Gems is committed to ending the cycle of domestic abuse by focusing on the economic recovery and empowerment of survivors. Now, we spoke with founder of Gems for Gems, Jordan Guilford, about Hope's Cradle and how municipalities like Sault Ste. Marie can play a role in saving the lives of infants who may otherwise have been unsafely abandoned. Jordan, I want to thank you so much for sitting down and talking about Hope's Cradle and particularly Gems to Gem. Uh, I want to start with sort of the uh, general question of where did the idea of Hope's Cradle come from and what is your connection with the organization? Sure. So uh, Hope's Cradle is something that uh, Gems for Gems founded um, and we actually launched our first cradle in 2021. Uh, and it's something that, that uh, has been a really beautiful learning process and we're very excited about being able to make an impact in, in communities across Canada. Um, it started because our board chair is a homicide detective and um, sadly when the babies don't make it, when babies are abandoned and, and they pass away due to that, they become his cases because as soon as the, that happens, it's a criminal case. So um, there was one particular case that really hit um, Dave Sweet is his name, particularly hard. And that was, uh, I believe it was 2017. Um, and it was a baby uh, that was found deceased on Christmas Eve. Um, so obviously the timing of that is, it's always horrific, but the timing at Christmas time was particularly, um, I don't know, just hit, it hit a little differently. Um, so Dave had uh, been obviously very sad having to work that case. And I had heard about it on the news, but at the time it wasn't part of our organization's mandate at all. So I had started doing some research on my own. I didn't tell our board at all. And then uh, two years or so after that, Dave approached me and asked me if there was anything that I thought our organization could do because more and more babies kept being found. And, um, and I said, you know what, I would absolutely love that. So we put together a pitch and we pitched it to our board and immediately everyone said, heck yeah. So uh, then we got to work, uh, but of course it was 2019, uh, late in 2018, 2019 and COVID hit. So probably the worst possible time I could imagine to try to do a collaboration with a hospital. And that was the route that we wanted to go in the beginning, um, simply because that's where the babies end up every single time. Um, so we thought, why have any middlemen? Why don't we just go right to the source? Um, but yeah, the worst possible time. And the hospitals were so supportive and kind and lovely, but they just kept saying, this is great, not now, not now, not now. And we kept trying and we kept being told the same thing. And uh, eventually more babies kept um, being found and uh, all deceased uh, except for one. But um, 
I, I eventually got tired of waiting and I decided to shift gears. And that's when we started looking uh, for alternative places. And I very quickly was connected with uh, Captain Eric Alexander out of the Strathmore station. And uh, within five months, we had our first cradle. So what is the cradle? So what is the, uh, the it's sort of the object of the cradle? Because uh, you're right. It is a, a horrendous uh, sta stat that babies who are born are being left and dying. Mm -hmm. And you, you taken this and turned it into sort of a silver lining, if you mm -hmm. want, for those who do have the options to get to places to uh I don't want to say deposit, but uh, give, we say surrender, uh, uh, surrender, surrender, surrender yeah. their children to a uh, safe place. So, how mm -hmm. did the fire department in Strathmore get involved, and why? Why was the fire department the the best second choice compared to the hospital? So, I mean, there's obvious perks of working with a fire station in a situation like this, where uh, one, they they are often looked at as community heroes. Um, so they have often their finger on the pulse, if you will, of their community and, you know, their husbands and, and daddies and uncles. And so there's um, a great connection there as far as just general presence in the community. But specific to this, uh, to our connection to the fire station in Strathmore was Captain Eric Alexander. And interestingly, it was the exact same case that had bothered Dave Sweet so much, had bothered me to the point where... I already had done most of the research for the pitch to the board and then had also activated Eric um, as a dad of, of a few young kids at the time. Um, so we all kind of came at it without knowing all of us were activated, but we all came at it from our own different angles. And it was that specific case that brought us all to the, it uh, made us hop into action. Um, so because he had already started working on it, as soon as I put my feelers out, uh, for an alternative uh, location for this, I was immediately connected with him because he had already activated and was already on people's radar that he wanted to do this. Um, and this so, is all uh, anonymous, right? So the parent is. who surrenders the child, uh, the the baby, uh, this is not like they walk into a fire hall and just uh, surrender the child. This is an actual quote unquote cradle where mm -hmm. you put the surrendered uh, baby into a, a cradle for warmth mm -hmm. and security, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I love that you're asking me about this because this is a really critical piece of, of the importance of this initiative, Hope's Cradle. Um, when you look at all the different reasons why people choose the unsafe of uh, surrendering or abandonment in that situation, um, it's the anonymity piece that is so important to them. And when we look at the statistics and when we look at um, the individual cases, so many of them come from either horrific violence, the women are exposed to horrific violence, or they're trafficked, which is also a different form of horrific violence, but it can be within a marriage, it can be within while they're living with their parents, it can be um, that they're trafficked. And and when you look at even the, the trafficking situation, oftentimes these babies are leveraged either to make their mothers do more or abuse themselves. Uh, so when we do look at that, I think it's really important to really understand that we cannot possibly understand what's going through the, the minds and, and hearts of these mothers. And um, in that situation, I don't blame them. I'm not saying I agree, but I don't blame them for feeling their baby is better off not existing if it's being sexually abused right out you know it's horrific and I think it's it's very easy to villainize the mothers but I think it's really important as a community to really look at this on both sides of the equation and instead of judging just be there to be able to support in every way we possibly can and part of that way is providing an anonymous option so that women can choose the safe anonymous option as opposed to the only anonymous option which they have which is the unsafe abandonment it, it just just to, for clarification here and i just want to make sure i put this on the mm -hmm. record here it, it's not always the mother who's uh giving up a baby it can sometimes be a father who a single father who just is at their wits end who might be living on the street who has no other place to turn or are you only looking at uh mothers who are potentially giving up their uh surrendering their babies to uh this uh program 
So there's there's no criteria for who can. It's yeah. just that that to date I am unaware of, okay. of a situation. I, you have to understand too, Chris. For the most part, these are newborn babies. So uh, I, and I apologize part, if that question came out of left field. It just oh, I just fine. wanted to get some context about you. You're talking about uh, the uh, the mother giving up, and I'm like, okay, yes. what if a father gives it up? Is it totally. still but, yeah? Totally. And I, I, you know what, I think, I think you really, and first of all, you can throw as many curveballs my way as you <laughs> like, I'll catch right. them all. But, <laughs> um, but I think it's actually a really good thing to, um, to bring in the fathers into this equation. Um, because sometimes, uh, I, as in, as with all things, you know, that, that, I mean, you look at the pro-life, pro-choice, all of that, it really, um, there's so much polarization here. And I, and I think that, uh, some of that can be extended um, to Hope's Cradle if, if we're not open to talking about this. So I appreciate that very much. Um, yes, anyone can can surrender their babies here. There's no uh, criteria. I speak to the mother side only because that is, I don't know a situation where it hasn't been. Again, primarily because these babies are are very new. Um, so for the most part, that's it's only the mother typically that that is uh, with them when you're looking at traffic or dangerous situations. But um, the other thing that I think is really important is that uh, any parent has 30 days to be able to reclaim their baby. So part of something that comes up is what happens if the mother does this and there's a father that wants the baby. Um, and we're ta- again, we're talking about a born baby so again it we we can get into the weeds about everything that happens before that but that's not what hope's cradle is it's very much this is this is um this is where we begin uh is a a live baby that has been born and and honestly again in in every case that i'm aware of um what i call a viable birth so the baby is healthy um and totally capable of surviving so in that situation, if uh, if someone was to surrender a baby, uh, a mother was to surrender and a father didn't know or, or something like that happened, the father can go um, say, this is my baby and, and reclaim the baby 100%. What's the what's the option? What's the what's the steps afterwards? So uh, a a parent surrenders their child to Hope's Cradle. Mm-hmm. What goes next? And we're going to get into the municipal aspect here because I just want to sure. give my viewers and my listeners a context about what this program sure. is before talking sure. about the municipalities. Sure. So what's the steps after? So someone comes in, surrenders. That thirty day passes. What what's what's the next step in that process? Do they become a ward of the province, the country? Yeah. What what is the what what is the steps? Because I just want to make sure there's clarification around how you guys deal with the aftermath of someone surrendering yeah, a baby. Yeah, sure. Great question. So uh, to put it really simply, Hope's Cradle's job begins when the mother opens the door and places the baby there. An alarm goes off and second the door is opened. And then our job as a cradle ends when the first responder comes and takes the baby. So Hope's Cradle is not, and, and, and you know, it's heartbreaking to me because I get mothers from all around the country, women from all around the country asking me if they can sign up to be a Hope's Cradle mother. And it's heartbreaking to me. It's beautiful and heartbreaking. But um, our job, the job of the cradle is very simply to provide a safe alternative to an unsafe choice that is happening now. Uh, but the the protocol that is across Canada is that once a baby is placed there and the silent alarm goes off, so we are a legally safe uh, a legal safe surrender site. So one beautiful thing about that is that the mother does not get a criminal record, or anyone who who places a baby here does not get a criminal record, uh, which they would. It would be a criminal case if they abandon their baby anywhere that is deemed that is not deemed a safe surrender. So that's another. We really try to be as um, good to both sides of the equation as we possibly can so we we tick all the boxes there so once the baby is placed in there um there's anywhere from two to ten minutes typically before um the people who are alerted will come and collect the baby and as soon as that alarm goes off uh dispatches is, is notified and that means 911 that means often firefighters that means i mean in children in the case of the children's cottage in in Calgary, it is the children's cottage staff that will be notified and then they, their protocol would begin. So they have to call 911 and all of that. The baby goes to the hospital 
Um, and then from the hospital, Children's Services takes over. So I want to bring in the municipal aspect here because sure. this this program, Hope's Cradle, has been uh, launched in here in Alberta, in Manitoba, mm -hmm. in yes. my home a community of Clarington, Ontario, uh, yes. in Durham. And yes. then this sort of conversation sparked because Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, uh, mm -hmm. put forward a motion which was unanimously passed to investigate this. Yes. Now, I, I can imagine there's other conversations going on across Canada with other municipalities as well. What does it mean for you as the mm -hmm. sort of founder CEO of uh, Gems to Gem to have municipalities wanting to sign on and bring hope's cradle to their community so mothers parents don't feel like they need to neglect their babies and just leave them somewhere unsafe where they could potentially die mm -hmm. so my first reaction is so much gratitude um that this is taking off the way it is my other side is that it is uh, absolutely essential that it does. Uh, so I work very hard and our team works very hard at being able to make this grow. Um, and there's some obstacles along the way. Um, this is actually the first um, vote at the council level that um, was about was uh, to in, in, to investigate it. All the rest of them have been to say yes or to say no to them. Uh, so this is uh, it's a great step in the right direction. Um, but now they will have to do this again, I would think, um, and pass. Yeah, so so this is this is a new uh, situation for me with Sault Ste. Marie. That does not mean that I'm not um, as grateful as I am for all the rest of them because a step in the right direction is is perfect. But so what does the partnership between the municipality and Gems for Gem look like? Is it you going in and actually building the Hope's Cradle yes. at the fire hall, or is it here's the schematics and just go do it yourself? So the bare bones of it is that our organization builds the cradles. Uh, we have all the plans for it. We build it. But the, the beautiful thing that also happens is that every single one of the locations that have worked with us to date have been so happy with their process with GEMS and all of that, that they want to be uh, they want to maintain the contact and be part of a, a larger community of Hope's Cradle host organizations or host locations. So what that looks like is that now every single person that signs on now has someone supporting them from the fire station side, from the municipal side, from the uh, the launch planning for the grand opening. Like, so now everyone that comes has support from absolutely every angle. So if they're worried about their presentation, they can run it by several other people who have done it successfully. And, and what's beautiful is that we are building this lovely community that is all there just rooting for this uh, for this initiative to to expand i have to tell you like the it is absolutely critical that it that it expands um i'm a big believer in when you know better you must do better and the bottom line is we know what is happening and we do have something that can can help and i i think it's it is pivotal that we consider this um something that must be accessible for all women in need we are coming up into the colder months here now, and it is probably more critical than ever to have uh, Hope's Cradle launched more quickly. Mm -hmm. um, what what does the organization need to do and what are you doing to sort of get that message out besides doing interviews like this, hoping that people find out through other partnering municipalities? What are you doing to make sure that municipalities understand that there's a need for this and mm -hmm. you're here to help them get, work through this process with them so our team um has reached out to if not every fire station in alberta then darn close to it um uh and really our what we're trying to do is just uh, really raise awareness behind the fact that it is a when not an if the next baby is found and this is something you can do to be on the right side of that inevitable sad event so uh we are reaching out to everyone that we can think of um and we are we are doing I, I am doing as many interviews as i possibly can because i so appreciate your ability to have 20 20 minutes with me and then be able to reach all of your listeners and and what i would say to all your listeners is that it's very doable um i think a lot of times people feel that their small act is not large enough to make a difference um, and so they do nothing rather than even something small. Well, doing something small here literally can result in saving a life and maybe many lives. And I, I 
I would counsel people to be careful that their own fears of their own limitations don't stop them from from acting here because it's very achievable and uh, and we're here to help every single step of the way. So as I have listeners who are more municip- municipal politicians from mm-hmm. coast to coast to coast here in Canada and mm-hmm. potentially even around the world, how mm-hmm. can people reach out? How can people learn more? How can people start that initial step? Because the, the process of doing this starts with one single step. So mm-hmm. where can people learn more about this uh, organization, Hope's Cradle, and start that conversation with you guys to make sure that this is, becomes a reality sooner rather than later? Thank you for that. Uh, so they can go to our website, which is just gemsforgems.com. And on it, there's a, a very large section on Hope's Cradle. There's a, a lot of different media, There's um, which has interviews that answer a lot of questions like yours. And um, also uh, we have a slideshow on there. We have uh, the other locations. And um, and the next step would be if, if they decide to do this, or even if they're even interested, is to put out feelers into their own community and see if regardless of funds, uh, if someone would be willing to host a Hope's Cradle. And this could be a women's shelter. Uh, um, Children's Cottage is a um, child crisis center. Um, so there's there's so many fire stations. There, there's, there's so, so it doesn't have different... to be a fire station is no, what you're saying. No, no, it can be, it, the fire stations are uh, an easy win when it's an easy win. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not always been, but um, but when it is, it's it's great because there's a first responder that's there. But um, but it's you, the fire stations. One is twenty four seven. One is entirely volunteer. Another one is like essentially nine to nine, I think. But the fact that there's the the alarm and then it's backed up and and all of that, it it the criteria um, primarily is that people are motivated to be able to be part of making this change and bringing this uh, resource to their community. Um, so we, we are very happy to work with, with anyone that we possibly can and, and everyone is welcome to reach out. So before I let you go, I have one sort of a generic follow-up question to that sure. is what's next for you? What's next for the organization? Because we've talked about the uh, the past, where it came from, what's happening mm-hmm. now, but what does the future look like for you? Well, our goal is a lofty one, which probably won't surprise you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, our goal is to be able to have uh, Hope's Cradles in every major city and in as many towns as we possibly can. And I, um, I, I, I would like to see us achieve that. Um, hopefully five to eight years um so we have time but we don't know how much time we have per location um i i would like to leave you with one story that um our our board chair told me um one of the most recent babies that were found in the calgary area was found by a homeless person looking for food in a dumpster and um and the baby was deceased and uh, because of that, obviously, a, a criminal case. Um, so they um, they reached out to the community to try to find whoever placed the baby there. And at the time, I can't remember if it was six or eight, somewhere in there, maybe even 10 women identified that were pregnant, no longer pregnant, and no baby. So what, what we feel is that... Uh, there's a lot, we, what we find is the tip of the iceberg. Um, it's incredibly, and this is a horrible thing to think of, but it's incredibly, there's so little, it's incredibly easy to get away with this. Uh, I don't mean this in a, in a mean way, but it is incre- <clears throat> incredibly easy to not find a teeny little package like that. So um, I, I hope that we can get people really on board um, with understanding that this is a much bigger problem than we could ever possibly grasp and, and being able to do the right thing accordingly. Jordan. um, Thank you. Um, Thank you for doing this. Um, We often forget that there's a human side to things going on municipally and Uh, Sometimes it's hard to look under the rock, but uh, I'm glad that there's uh, a gem in in that search. And thank you so much for 
sitting down and chatting about these issues and Hope's Cradle. Uh, to my listeners and to my viewers, um, the link to Gems to Gem is in the show notes. So if you want to learn more, if you want to support this amazing organization and making sure this becomes a reality in more municipalities, in more communities, in more small towns where these issues aren't just a large town or a small town issue. This is a, a Canadian issue. Please donate to them as well. The, sh the, the link will be in the show notes as well. So Jordan, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for doing this. And thank you so much for taking time and talking to me today. My absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Cross-Border Interviews invites you to join our show and share your passion for public service. We want to hear from you about your inspiring stories and insights on how you're making a difference in your community. Join us on Cross-Border Interviews, where leaders from across Canada come together to discuss their communities, their commitment, and their service. Let your voice be heard and help inspire others to serve their communities as well. Contact us today and be part of the conversation. Together, we can build stronger, more connected communities. In an effort to bolster the economic prospects of central Saskatchewan, the Mid-Saskatchewan Municipal Alliance, comprising of several municipalities in east-central Saskatchewan, has taken a collaborative approach to harness the full potential of the mining industry there. With a vision for sustainable growth and development, the Alliance is steadfast in its commitment to establish a comprehensive long-term strategy for the region. Now, at its core, the Alliance is dedicated to facilitating a robust and effective platform for its member municipalities, enabling them to address shared hurdles and capitalize on collective opportunities. Now, growth in the region has been moving at a fast pace since 2021, when BHP announced that they would be building a $7.5 billion potash mine near Quill Lake. Now, with a shared vision for the long-term advancements of the region, the Alliance continues to spearhead initiatives while amplifying the voices and impacts of the region. Now, we sat down with Barry Morishita, the Alliance's Executive Director, about the Alliance and the challenges laying ahead as the Alliance prepares for its opening of the Potash Mine in 2026. Barry, thank you so much for doing this. I, I, I want to start with sort of the generic question, then get into some of the more details a little bit later. But can you explain to me what the MSMA is? So for those who are listening right now, that's the Mid, Mid Saskatchewan Municipal Alliance. And how do you connect with them? Okay, well, they so so first of all, that yeah, they've got a history. So um, BHP, uh, the potash mine, been talked about for a while, and so. The history of the kind of municipal association was that they were going to get together um, regionally to prepare for the eventual uh, produ mine production that would happen. And that's been a stop and start process for a long time. Um, but uh, they are, you know, constructing um, full bore right now. Uh, they will be, the plan is to be in production by 2026, towards the fall of 2026. And so it's kind of been stop and start for a while, but now it's kind of full bore again. And um, uh, I'm my job as the executive director is uh, to work for these seven municipalities that are members, um, as well as the region generally and with BHP to provide uh, to make sure the economic benefits are provided for the community, make sure the mine can uh, function. Uh, so there's lots of things that go into that in a small rural community. So you talk about the municipal aspect. So this is the Mid-Saskatchewan Municipal Alliance, and I want to stick to the municipal side here. Sure. Um, can you explain to me how the municipalities play into a, a project like this uh, potash mine? Because I, I'm trying to figure out how what, what benefits are they sort of getting with this alliance of, you say, seven from the reports I said, as high as 13, as low as 11, but you're saying seven. So what are the economic benefits and the sort of the benefits of the alliance as one instead of seven individual municipalities? Well, to begin with, uh, uh, we've talked about this before, I think, Chris. Um, regional, I think regional is the approach. I, I think municipalities, generally speaking, and it's no different in Saskatchewan, uh, you know, they run really, really thin. They they run razor on the razor's edge when it comes to budgeting. They don't get a lot of opportunity to put those projects that are on the corner of the desk right in front of them. 
And the idea behind getting together, which I think is a sound one, is to try to create capacity for everybody and then get some added value. The, the opportunity that's in front of this area, which is about actually 30 municipalities altogether, there's a lot of RMs in Saskatchewan, so there's a lot of those. The population, though, is only about 30,000 people, um, and they've got to absorb a significant amount of uh, direct jobs and then the service jobs that come supporting uh, that many extra workers and such. So every community by themselves really doesn't have the capacity to do much more than what they're doing in their community. And, and we've all been faced with that. You've interviewed them, 100 counselors who tell you that story. So the idea for the group is, is to, to build on the economic opportunity that's in front. So to get the communities ready for housing, to create welcoming communities for labor, uh, to uh, make sure we have services like daycares, make sure uh, we're a business friendly place for development, those kinds of things. And by doing it together, um, they've created the capacity to get that job done. Did the Alliance work as sort of the planning and development department of these municipalities? Because that's where I was trying to, a little bit confused when I was doing research on the town of Leroy's website, the town of Watu, Wateris, or yeah, Wateris, yeah. Wateris's website, is you're dealing, the, the Alliance is dealing with a lot of the planning and development, the statutory plans, the official plans for these municipalities. Is that correct? Well, they were they were uh, instrumental in helping get them getting them coordinated. They um, administered some of the grant. Oh, you want to hang on a second, and I'll just kill that. Yeah, you can pick up right from the uh, the beginning of the okay. question. Yeah. So, so uh, what the MSMA did was they were very instrumental in coordinating to make sure those uh, official community plans were done, that there was some continuity in plans, that there was, uh, you know, some consistency between municipality members, um, and that to make it uh, easier for development to be ready for those applications. Um, and that's kind of where some of it started. There's the, the way the planning commissions work in Saskatchewan, to be completely honest, I don't fully understand it yet. But there, um, there was a role that MSMA was playing, although I think it's less significant now. Um, but primarily when it comes to those kinds of things, Chris, is to, to make sure that we're uh, ready to um, accept uh, applications. But more importantly, we're actually going to, hopefully the goal is to lead us uh, into it, to prepare these communities to accept, you know, new innovative housing, affordable housing, all kinds of housing uh, opportunities because they're no, no, not different than a lot of part of Canada. They struggle with housing availability. They struggle with rental availability and all of those things are going to be required. And, uh, and in, you know, when it comes to building and construction, 2026 is not very far away. So this potash, and I'm just going to read off the uh, BHP's website here just for uh, so, so I'm getting the correct information. Sure. This is a $7.5 billion investment into the area of Janssen Stage 1, and it was announced in 2021. The Janssen site, of which uh, they own 100%, is located approximately 140 kilometers east of Saskatoon near Quill Lake. I, I kind of need to ask the question that I, I, I basically want to try and get to is, what is the biggest challenges that mini these municipalities are facing heading into 2026? Because you're right, it's not that far away. That's two years away. Work is still ongoing, but you need to sort of ramp projects up and make sure you are prepared for almost two years from now. What do you see as the biggest challenge that the Alliance faces over the next few years? Well, um, you know, originally I would have said it's just understanding how to regionalize, but the seven members in particular uh, seem very ready for that. It's one of the reasons I took the position I did. But then the next challenge is to, to make yourself ready for all of the new opportunities that exist in development. So that means, again, this is making sure those plans are suitable for modern building, uh, for, uh, you know, out-of-the-box innovation when it comes to development, uh, different partnerships, uh, different entities that are going to spur development on. You know, we've talked already about everything from municipal corporations to how do we partner with uh, private industry. All of those different kind of uh, opportunities 
because I don't think we can be stuck on one path forward. There's just far too much demand on housing across this country. And I think the goal is for this group to make uh, make itself attractive, um, investment friendly in terms of return on investment for communities. And, and I think we're really well positioned to do that and take advantage of the workforce that's going to be there and then the support services that have to come with that workforce. You, you talked about housing a few times already in this interview. So I want to pick up on that line of questioning here. Um, do you see or are you when you're talking to the members of the alliance are they saying developers are knocking at the door they want to build in the the area because they see the benefits of this uh seven billion dollar project that's in their area so they want to build are you seeing developers are there developers wanting to come in and start building those diverse types of housings that is needed so uh, you know i think there's been lots of you know surface inquiries um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't think we've seen the real serious ones to this date, at least that I that I can see. Um, again, because the two and a half years is right in front of us here, uh, it's going to have to happen pretty quickly in order for them to take advantage of it. So part of our goal is to make sure that uh, we're getting that signal out, that message out that, hey, you need to come now if you want to be ready to, to be the companies involved taking advantage um, I think that one of the biggest challenges is that, you know, it's like every rural area, you know, the growth is generally s slow and steady, or uh, in some cases is actually, you know, places are shrinking because the province and uh, in their wisdom sees it fit to pull services away or to consolidate uh, activity and then that affects communities. So um, I think the opportunity for us is to take advantage to build on that. It's both the advantage because I think the relative cost of doing business in in the area that we're representing is very reasonable uh, but um, service supply is an issue because um, you know people are concerned about hospitals and schools and uh, they're concerned about health care access and doctors and you know that's where the partnership has to be a bit broader where the province has to be with us and and I'm you know I'm pretty happy to say that right now we're working really well with the Saskatchewan government on that economic front, uh, realizing that we all have a role to play to make uh, Saskatchewan an attractive place to, to de develop. And with a seven and a half billion dollar uh, investment, you can see the certainty of it. So there's a lot of things pointed the right direction. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about the opportunities, both for the communities to grow and be sustainable, but also for the municipalities to uh, increase their ability to resource things and get things done and work together to to make a, a better community for everybody. You talk about the provincial government, but there's another level of government that's involved as well, I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong. What, what role does the federal government have to play with helping the alliance make sure that this project is successful, but also make sure that things go off and make sure the, the communities aren't sort of being neglected along the way? Well, you know, I think between uh, CMHC and some of the housing uh, fund opportunities, I think uh, it, just being fair about the process, I, I think that's the main thing. Um, uh, from what I understand to this point, um, having not been involved really directly in the administrative side, that there seems to be um, good opportunities uh, in Saskatchewan in terms of getting access to funding to do this. So we're hopeful there. And I think that's really it. The federal government is at the table with the money and there seems to be money available now. It's just making sure that um, we can do the job to get access to it and politics stay out of the decision making, to be quite frank. I hope that's the case. Which which is good. I want to talk about the members for a little bit, if that's OK. Well, one question on them, because the, the alliance is made up of a city of Humboldt all the way down to a resort community. And I can imagine Everyone has their own vested interest and have their own vested wants and needs for communities, whether it be a small or to a large urban center. How do you see yourself in that role in making sure that everyone's voices are heard around the alliance table to make sure that this is a successful alliance and not just an alliance uh, in name only? Uh, that's a, you know, uh, I, that was one of the, uh, it's interesting you posed that question. And just And just for clarity, Humboldt is currently not a member right now. Um, okay. So that just so just for clarity, that's kind of a, been a moving thing, and they currently are not. So just to be clear, but the point is still the same. 
you know, even though we have the seven members in the alliance, uh, we're still looking at this fully regionally because it's the only proper way to look at it. And and my and the members that are there are very committed to that. And it is difficult uh, because. You know, I've I've seen municipal partnerships come and go in my time in Alberta, and you know, with a lot of disappointing results because people saw partnership kind of uh, collaborations and alliances and and uh, those things as well. I've got to get my piece out of it, just like everybody else. Yeah. Um, and this group's very focused on the idea that what's good for the region is good for them. You know, they they know that if you have enough population to support the school and the hospital and doctors, then those services remain not just for the current residents, but they're available for new residents. And they they know that if even if it's not located in their boundary, uh, that it's in the next municipality down, there seems to be a really good vision for that. And that, that's the vision that we have to hang on to. And certainly some have more resource, for instance, some might not be able to build a, a hundred unit apartment because they don't have the water treatment capacity or the other, some other issues, but some may, some may be able to build seniors housing. And it really doesn't matter what type of units are being built. There's a demand for all of them here. And as, as we've seen, when you build appropriate housing, whether it's seniors care or assisted living, there's homes that become vacant. There's uh, there's other stock brought onto the market. So it's identifying those pieces and being thinking regionally about it. And and this group is very committed to that. So that, and that's what excites me about being here. There's a commitment to actually doing it regionally. And uh, if if we hold fast with that, we're going to see a very successful outcome for these seven as well as the region as we get more and more involved in it. So on, on the MSMA website, and I'm quoting here from the website, the MSMA is committed to a, uh, committed and effect is a committed and effective regional collective of municipalities dedicated to serving the needs of businesses to support further development, enhance its limitless potential. Now that's a big order to ask for a region, particularly with everything going on in the world right now. I'm going to ask the million dollar question. Is it achievable in before 2026 to get this all done and in place before this uh, potash mine is up and running? Uh, you know, I think, I think it is. Um, and, and here's the two reasons why one is that we do have the certainty of the investment. So we know the, there's going to be a significant block of workers that need to live within a reasonable distance of the mine. So we know that. We know that for every person that works, there's going to be one and a half to two and a half people that need to be supported through that. Uh, we, we have some certainty. So that's one. That that really eliminates a big unknown, uh, a risk for developers, whether you're the municipality, whether you're the private sector. So we've got that. And the secondly is, like I said, this commitment to growing the region versus only growing myself. I think such such an important thing because you know what if 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 a developer comes along and uh, you know we can sit as a group and say, hey, you know what, your best bet is to be here. And yes, I know you would love to have it, and I know you would love to have it. But really, we all agree that this is really the best opportunity for this to grow. That's another 30 people that get to move into the region. We have certainty there. Then we move on to the next projects. And I, I think that thinking is going to make us successful. The other thing is really interesting is that um, the way the province is working with the MSMA right now, they're very focused on doing things rather than producing another plan. You know, um, regional plans and growth plans and growth studies, uh, you know, there's there's lots of that stuff laying around. There's lots of that stuff being produced. A lot of it has been produced recently, just, you know, for all the business cases the mine has made and some of the studies that uh, other economic development. So, so all of that exists. What they really seem to be committed, and we're online with that, is how do we leverage the resources we have into an action? How do we make sure that we're, um, you know, reaching out to modular developers and saying, hey, you know, there's a real opportunity for you here. Can you partner in with us? And, you know, what could we put on this chunk of land? What does it look like? Let's 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 do some work. Let's try to get this in front of this. And there's a real commitment to this. So I really feel confident that um, there's a 
really good opportunity to, to show some very good regional successes when this is all done. I might have to check in on you in about a year's time just to make sure that things are still progressing the way they need to be. Thank you so much, Mary. Greatly no, appreciate thank it. you, Chris. I, I think it, that's a, it's an area to watch for sure. Join us on Municipal Affairs and let your brand shine where it matters most in the heart of local communities. Get in touch today and learn how you can make a meaningful impact on municipalities from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. Your success is our mission, and together we can build stronger, thriving communities together. Reach out today. Over the last few weeks, one City of Airdrie councillor embarked on a Hike for Hunger campaign to fundraise for the city's local food bank. Airdrie councillor Tina Petro's goal of the Hike for Hunger campaign was to fundraise a total of $10,000 for the local food bank. Now, her mission was to climb 5,000 meters in elevation gain while walking 60 kilometers in distance. Now, we sat down with Councillor Petro to discuss the climb and to discuss the Hike for Hunger campaign. Councillor Petro, thank you so much for doing this. I, I want to uh, ask, because I was following your story over the last few weeks, and I, I I can't believe that someone did it, but here we are. You climbed a mountain to help raise money or funds for the Airdrie Food Bank, correct? Uh, I have climbed four in the last month and a half. Yeah. So I can barely climb my stairs. What brings a, a counselor from Airdrie to say, I'm going to climb four mountains to help raise money to give back to my community? Well, um, our food bank was struggling. Um, they just needed, again, like every food bank is across the country right now. Um, and they just needed some help. So I thought, what's the hardest possible thing that I could do uh, to, to support them? No, I'm just joking. We, um, I had committed to climb one. Um, with uh, a colleague, I don't know why I can, like, I don't hike, I don't climb mountains, I just should say that I'm not in that great of shape, like, I'm not completely out of shape, but I'm not in good shape, um, but I had committed to do this one, and then when I heard about the food bank, we're like, okay, well, I'm already doing this one, um, so, okay, so we're gonna make a campaign out of this, and then we picked, um, there was four in total, three of them were part of the actual campaign, and, um, I said that I would climb 5,000 meters in elevation gain and 60 kilometers in 35 days. The hope was to raise $10,000 for the food bank. Um, we didn't make it to 10 grand, but our community as a whole made it way past that number. So I'm severely happy with the outcome. But yeah, it was the worst experience of my life. I hope to never do it again. Um, and I'm still sore today because we just did the last one on Sunday. So, wow. First off. Um, second. Uh, it seems like you're passionate about the food bank because we, we had a conversation. You've talked about the food bank as well. Um, a lot of people are struggling. This is one way that you could have given back. You you openly admit you don't, you're not, a, you're not a climber. Uh, take me through the mind process of actually getting at, at the base of that, those mountains and looking up and saying, okay, I'm climbing this and I'm doing it for a good reason. What was the, what was your mental, mental uh, sort of state climbing those mountains? Well, I can tell you that if I hadn't, if I had agreed to do these, I'm just going to keep saying the three mountains, because that was what was part of the fundraising campaign. If I had agreed to do those and there wasn't a charity component to it, I, I probably wouldn't have gone on all three of them. I probably have been like, yeah, one's enough. That's fine. I did it. It's good. Um, but I'm a firm believer that whatever you commit to, you need to follow through on. Um, and we don't quit and we don't, um, we don't back down from challenges. That's always been beliefs in my life. Um, and even I told you a little bit of my backstory of how I got to where I am in my life. It, there's just always clear cut signs of what you should be doing with your life. So I will say yes to almost anything except for dunk tanks. I draw the line at cold water. I don't do that. Um, but, but yeah, so just when you get to that, that point and there was many, many, many points where I just wanted to quit. I'm like, this is too much. My legs are burning. I have blisters on my feet. The last one we were in snow and when we got to the top, it looked like the day after tomorrow because everything was frozen sideways, which is creepy at best. Um, but you just keep going because you have to. You've committed to doing it and this is what's gonna hopefully get the money to the people that need it. So yeah, it was really just, just saying that you have to keep going because people are counting on you.
And how did the project come about? How did you get involved with the uh, Airdrie Food Bank to say, okay, did they approach you and say, well, you've already done this one. Can you do three more? Or did you go to them and say, I want to help. This is how I'm going to help. So just talk me through the process of how the idea of you and the food bank partnering together, because like you're, you're, you're a volunteer in your community. I can imagine you're dealing with a lot of different organizations, but you chose the food bank. Yeah, I, honestly, it was just the need. Um, okay. I, I know all of our nonprofits have a need right now, and they're all struggling a bit because funding has been reduced across the board for everything. Um, but this particular organization had put a call out to the community because they were really struggling. And it's our, our food bank is phenomenal. The volunteers are phenomenal. It's well run, and they rarely ever say, hey, we need help. They'll say donate here or something, but they rarely say, hey, we need help. So when you see that, and, and it doesn't come all the time, you're like, okay, it's it's serious and we need to help. So yeah, so we were just, I was sitting around with my husband at home and um, we're like, okay, well, you're doing this hike anyways, may as well do it for a good cause. And I'm like, yeah, sounds good. So then I just called them up and I'm like, this is what I'm thinking. Cause um, they had a really big food drive coming up um, the day of the second hike. Um, and I didn't want to interfere with that. So I didn't do want to do a food drive and compete with their big city wide one that they do annually with um, they do it with the Church of uh, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, who's kind of the person that does all or the organization that does the footwork on it. Um, and then I do a food uh, drive in December as well, leading up to Christmas. So I'm like, OK, let's do something different. And we figured uh, we'll do this. And then we just my husband, again, graphic designer, really genius guy with creative stuff. He just whipped up the stuff, these graphics for me and we kind of went from there. Uh, the food bank was really great to deal with because they opened up a little fund on their donation page. So if you, um, it's still open. So I'm going to say if you go to the Airdrie Food Bank website, you go to the uh, donate now page and there's, you can pick your fund and there's a hiking for hunger fund on there. Um, so they opened that up right away and they've been giving me updates of, of where we're sitting financially throughout it. And it's been, uh, they've been great partners for this. So for those who are listening and watching this, uh, the link to that fun page will be in the show notes. So if you want to give back, if you want to support a great cause, please scroll down and donate as much as you can. I, I know things are challenging out there right now, but every little bit helps. Or if you want, go support your local food bank, because I think there needs to be a big push for that. Uh, Counselor, thank you so much for sitting down and chatting about this issue. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Uh, anything we can do to highlight our nonprofits in our communities. So thank you very much for doing it. In by-election news across Canada, the village of Beesker, Alberta, elected Councillor David Leodin as their newest representative. Leodin will finish the term of the late Councillor Karen Ursu, who sadly passed away in July at the age of 68. Ursu had been an integral part of the council since 2011. In the three-way contest, Leodin secured 123 votes, while Stephanie Young received 43 votes and Mike Duffy came in third with 12 votes. Now in the town of Nipawin, Saskatchewan, they have a new mayor. Marion Zakaris won the by-election with over 50% of the votes cast. Zarekis beat out two other candidates to become the new mayor of the community. The other candidates were Brian Starkel and Laura Nyshalot. Zarekis garnered 540 votes, while Starkel won 456 votes, while Nyshalot garnered 72 votes. Heading into this week's multiple by-elections, on October 23rd, which is today, the city of Beaumont, Alberta, is heading to the polls to elect two new councillors, while voters in Booveridge, Fredericton Junction, Grand Lake, Rural Community of Hanwell, New Guants, Riverview, Southern Victoria, Sunbury, York South, and Tracy, New Brunswick will all be heading to the polls tonight as well. Later on this week, on October 25th, the town of Biagon, RM of Lumsden, and the RM of Edenwood, Saskatchewan will all be heading to the polls to elect new members of their council. While in Prince Edward Island, the RM of Victoria and the RM of Bredodane will be heading to the polls on October 30th. I just want to take a moment here and ask if you know of an upcoming by-election or if a community around you has an upcoming by-election that we have missed, 
please send them to us. We want to make sure that we cover as many by-elections as possible because they are important aspects of our democracy. So if you have a by-election or if you know of a by-election coming up, please visit www.crossborderinterviews.ca. That's www.crossborderinterviews.ca and submit your by-election news today. That's all for today's Municipal Affairs Report for October 23rd, 2023. We'd like to extend our heartfelt gratitude for all of those who have tuned in and watched today's episode or even downloaded it by Spotify. Remember, our mission is to bring you the most important municipal stories from across Canada. And we can't do that without you. So please keep sharing those stories with us. Share your municipal news, your municipal concerns, and even your municipal triumphs with us. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter in our communities. Your voices are essential, and we're here to amplify them. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking. Mm -hmm.